સાદર નમસ્કાર સુસાગતમ કેમ છો વણકમ અમૃત વ્યાખ્યા દિસ ઇઝ ઓલ્સો the 15th prl kamrit vyakhyan of 2.0 which we started on 30th of january 2023 that is last year after we completed the 75 episodes series of vyakhyans which we started on 4th of august 2021 and uh, this was meant to celebrate the pratham jubilee of prl and to cherish the history and legacy of prl in the area of space science and physics today we have yet another very distinguished vyakhyan karta with us professor ganapati d yadav who is uh, emeritus professor of eminence former vice chancellor of institute of chemical technology in mumbai and he is going to talk to us on a very very important topic a very contemporary topic that is net the net zero goal and sustainability and he will include in his talk green hydrogen technologies co2 refineries biomass polarization and waste plastic recycling so we all thank uh, professor yadav for agreeing to our invitation and to be with us today in the prl kamrit vyakhyan may i now request my colleague professor bala to formally introduce our speaker to the webex panel colleagues as well as those who have joined us live on the prl youtube channel over to you professor bala thank you uh, on behalf of prl it is my pleasure and honor to introduce professor ganpati d yadav he is one of the top most highly prolific and accomplished engineering scientist in india he was conferred padma shri the fourth highest civilian honor by the president of india in the year 2016 for his outstanding contributions to science and engineering he currently holds the title of national science chair of scrb dst government of india an emeritus professor of eminence and is the former vice chancellor of ict mumbai he was, he has personally won over 150 national and international honors awards fellowships editorships and several lifetime achievement awards by prestigious industrial organizations professional bodies and societies his cv is quite impressive and very very big there is a wikipedia page that is devoted to him and over 80 videos are available on him on the youtube due to time limitation i am keeping this this introduction short and now it is over to you professor yadav thank you thank you very much uh, dr balam for uh, kindly introducing me Uh, since i have a paucity of time i might zip through some of the slides so you pardon me but if you have any questions you can ask so typically this lecture is about what 45 minutes yes 45 minutes okay all right so you know sustainable development uh, the so called 17 sustainable development goals we can separate into three categories societal aspect economic aspects and the environment and and these are interrelated okay so one of the two important ones uh, is poverty and hunger and you have to reduce that by 2030 and we are talking about energy systems industry infrastructure and what not and of course climate change so let me you know take you through this uh, when we talk about green economy it is bio economy bio based economy that means replacing the non renewable or fossil fuels by renewable uh, materials and the so called circular economy so i'm going to talk uh, everything with reference to about to my theme so of course i'm going to consider hydrogen technologies uh, we have done a lot of work in that having several patterns then carbon dioxide should be treated as the new oil that is what i have been saying because instead of looking at it as a liability then of course this is linked to decarbonization 
biomass valorization and how hydrogen will play an important role in this. Then waste plastic recycling. So some of the ideas which I'm going to talk about there are exactly opposite what the government is doing and the circular economy and so-called recycle engineering. So net zero is an overused term everywhere nowadays. And of course, people talk about sustainability. But believe me, it is not net zero, but it is carbon negative energy sources, which is what we require. So net zero, uh, everybody is happy, but I'm not happy with that term. Okay, so this is one of the things which you know, if you want to go to Delhi these days, you know, uh, you're stranded because there's a lot of fog, the air quality index is more than 400. And the reason, uh, one of the reasons people say is the burning of uh, this uh, agri waste by farmers in that area. Indeed, though there are various statistics about this agri waste. So something like 350 million metric tons of agri waste is burned by farmers. Somewhere it says 500 million metric tons, but that they are they are burning the bag. So you see, this report was published by Times of India, and it says 500 million tons. And of course, so stubble burning is a very big issue. So why are they burning the stubble? Can we not convert that into some useful chemicals, materials, and with reference to the sustainability issue, uh, which I'm talking about? So let me go through this. So this is very important slide. Uh, in Before the pandemic, uh, we had concentration of carbon dioxide about 410 ppm. During that particular year, you know that there was a day, 10th of April, 2020, the cost of crude oil became negative. That means they were making, producing more than they can store. And hardly any activity was there, but still we added two ppm within a year. And now it's about, you know, 424, you know, plus minus here and there. That is what, you know, the actual situation is there. And if we don't have any technological interventions of curbing carbon dioxide emissions, we will have a very disastrous future. Uh, in the year uh, 2022, 36.4 gigatons of CO2 was emitted. And so I will tell you a little later, this is not a good situation. And if we do not do that, the constant, uh, the temperature is supposed to be less than 1.5 degrees C. That is the Paris Accord or Agreement. But if we continue like this, the projections are there that by 20 to 50, temperature of the globe will rise by six to eight degrees C. That is the end of the world, okay? So this is what the Paris Agreement said, and you know that United States did not sign this agreement, but later on, Joe Biden said that he would, and he did it. So this is, uh, you know, important part is 1.5 degrees C, but is it really the case? What has happened? You know, last year, this was in May 18th, uh, uh, the, last year, this World Meteorological Organization said that the CO2 emissions are rising like anything. And by 2027, we would have breached the 1.5 degree, you know, uh, the temperature uh, limit. So in other words, you know, in 2020, when uh, you see this year, in 2020, the 35 gigatons of carbon dioxide was emitted and 36.4, and if you want to keep the net zero goal and limit the temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, you have to take off a lot of carbon dioxide from atmospheres. In other words, we should not be having any carbon-based fuels. And that number is 10 gigatons, 10 billion tons. So we have to restrict our emissions in future to less than 10 gigatons, then only we'll be able to maintain the temperature of you know, rise to less than 1.5 degrees C. So taking carbon out of it. So this is one important thing. That is, we always blame the transport sector, but there are others like building and cities consume something like the, the, they emit something like 33% of carbon dioxide. We have industry, agriculture, food, forest. And of course, we don't need carbon in the atmosphere, but we need carbon in the soil, right? So, and so this is what I'm going to talk about. So one important thing is that in today's context, the world's top emitters of carbon dioxide, China is number one, US is number two, European Union is number three, when you take all of those countries, and India is number four, otherwise India becomes number three. 
and we emit something like 2.622 gigatons okay billion tons and so we have to make it zero right and that limit we have said 2070 that's what our honorable prime minister said so in other words whatever technology we develop it has to be carbon free technology or even if we use carbon based technology this net emission should be zero so and since we are now the most populous country we have to develop our own technology so 2.622 this is the number which will vary okay so now what is the reason the reason is that our economy is based on carbon so we have fossil carbon on one hand and another is the renewable carbon and so but the when you use carbon as an energy source the ultimate fate is carbon dioxide and that is responsible for global warming so you know we wrote this paper during that pandemic time and gave an analysis of variety of sources you know and how do we make chemicals and fuels in the new you know changing order uh, so this this is uh, this is available these are more than 10000 uh, downloads so so reason of this global warming is carbon based fuels so on one hand we are while refinery and another is bio refinery so people say for carbon neutrality we should have bio refinery right so you see that in this particular case when we use oil refinery or coal or whatever or natural gas that is greenhouse gas emissions and on the other hand when we have this uh, biomass based chemical whether it is gasification saccharification or extraction that is one of those that is so called carbon neutral okay so now uh, but so as i mentioned to you for climate change net zero is not the solution but net negative so how many trees you can plant right there is a limit to that so it is not tree plantation is one part of the story but that is not the complete story and at the same time we have issues related to waste you know, in the year 2016, 1.6 billion tons of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas was emitted. And this number is going to increase to 2.38 billion in 2050. So that is another part of the story. Now, if you look at the net zero targets, only 73% of the emissions are covered. 27% of the countries do not have any target. Either they are poor, they don't have technology, or they are insignificant. The most of the carbon emissions is coming from China, 25%, United States, 12%, European Union, 7%, and the rest, 29%, in which India is included. So that is 29%. So that is the real story of this climate change. Okay. So if we look at the you know global uh, power generation, the energy projections, what is said by 2050, when we are supposed to have the, the advanced world, India and China are not included in that. China is 2060, India is 2070. This will be 49,000 terawatt hours of energy. Now, so in 2050, you will have still coal, gas, nuclear energy, hydro, wind, solar. But you will see very interestingly, 20% of this energy should be targeted by India. India's policy should be to have 20% of this target and we must go for you know, renewable resources. So there is solar will be there, wind will be there, hydro, nuclear, as coal will be still used. And so coal will be clean coal technology. And believe me, by 2050, no oil will be there, which will be used for you know, energy. So I normally call this as a new trinity of science, that is solar energy, wind energy, and hydrogen energy. And hydrogen I call as a prime devas. Devas is a Sanskrit word meaning deity. And so hydrogen will be the prime deity, okay? And hydrogen is going to be the savior of the world. So let me explain to you what I mean by that. You know, hydrogen, you know, over the years, since you look at the earlier times, 1850, we had liquid fuels and then we, we picked, okay, then we had this oil. So we started with wood and hay and all, and then coal and slowly we are gone. By 2050, we are supposed to, you know, abundant coal. And natural gas going to hydrogen. So in future, it will be hydrogen if you talk about hydrogen as the energy carrier. Okay, and there are many ways by which hydrogen is produced. One of the most prominent is the steam methane refinery. Almost 
50% is produced by that, oil reforming, coal gasification, water electrolysis, where people are talking a lot about this. So I will tell a little bit about that as well. So why hydrogen? Because hydrogen is energy dense. So it is a specific energy is very high in comparison with wood, ethanol, coal, any other fuel. And so hydrogen has a lot of uses like transportation in two wheeler, three wheeler, four wheeler, IC engines. You know, in fact, yesterday I was in Delhi uh, in the JCB, you know, these uh, excavators, if you've known these bulldozers, they have now developed an engine where they use hydrogen. Okay. Very, I was very pleased uh, to see that. And then, of course, green power, synthetic fuels from carbon dioxide. So hydrogen will, you know, pervade everything. Upgrading of bio oil, which is normally produced by pyrolysis or hydrogenation of biomass and this our government is talking a lot about green ammonia and green fertilizers as the steel industry emits a lot of uh, you know carbon dioxide chemical and allied industry produces very little carbon dioxide in comparison with others and waste plastic recycling hydrogen will again play a very important role and i'm going to tell you how it will happen and of course and heat and distributed power so the projections for hydrogen, because normally businessmen people always ask, yes, what is that future for hydrogen? So it is a bright future. So demand can vary depending on who is projecting it. Like International Energy Agency says it will be 20.3% by 2050 and about 520. And they say hydrogen by color, so-called blue and green. So green 59, the other blue is 40. Hydrogen Council says it can have 50-50 E1 split, they say 18%, so in the energy demand, and that is 25-75. The high value say again, same thing, the other way around, right? you know, or the so-called Energy Transition Commission. So they project 24% of energy demand by hydrogen. So in other words, no matter who projecting it, it is, uh, it is, yes, anywhere between 514 to 813 million metric tons. And the problem is, it is not just hydrogen. What At what cost you can make this? Hydrogen technologies are very cumbersome and at the same time, you know, they are not affordable. Now, what is uh, uh, the target across the world is $1 per kg. But thermodynamically, it is difficult to get it below 2.5 degree. Electrolyzers will never give it. We did this calculation, thermodynamic calculations on electrolysis. I will tell you that story a little later. But yes, in the real world, the cost is about $5 per kg. So, and today's uh, manufacturing of hydrogen, about 120 million metric tons, 96% is gray, that is produced by steam methane reforming. And this is one important area where we want to reduce the and who is using maximum petroleum refineries and uh, uh, required and also steel industry. And the electrolyzers typically they require 50 units, okay, for one kg of hydrogen. And so European Union say that they will target about 700 million metric tons, okay. And there is a lot of investment there, you know, that is about $1.5 trillion, you know, infrastructure for solar and wind uh, energy. So if you look at green, blue, and gray, the colors, I would tell you, they can add pink also that where you use the, you know, uh, nuclear energy. Green uh, hydrogen is electrolytic. Hydrogen per se has no color, but this is the color is given to the process. So electrolysis of water or thermochemical water splitting, which we are doing in ICT from since uh, 2006. So that is the gold standard. Then blue is where you can produce hydrogen by any means, whether it is renewable or non-renewable, you have to capture at least 90% of the carbon dioxide and you can sequester it or use it somewhere else. And gray hydrogen is steam reforming of fossil-based uh, you know, uh, fuels where the core product is carbon dioxide. So typically one ton of say uh, hydrogen in the gray uh, hydrogen produces 11 tons of carbon dioxide. There is another one which is called the turquoise hydrogen that is pyrolysis of natural gas where you produce carbon and hydrogen. So and, and to add to that something called white hydrogen. Now this was introduced 
you know, uh, so it's a natural hydrogen. The CNN reported this in October. They said anywhere between 6 million to 250 million metric tons of white hydrogen. And this is near Mali and people have started reporting. They are finding some new results. So this is one story. And here they say that this hydrogen can cost about $1.5 per kg, but nothing has been done technologically right now. What is, uh, you know, very interesting, our ministry of uh, this MNRE, they say the green hydrogen definition, they change and they said, you know, two kg of carbon dioxide equivalent per kg of hydrogen. Uh, that should be called as green. Now, see, giving incentive is something and calling something green. Green definition is without carbon dioxide. So obviously everything should be green. The energy source must be green. What they are assuming here is that they say because they, there is a lot of this fossil activities and compressors and this is being used, so this two kg is an allowance. But really speaking, that is not the definition. Definition is without carbon dioxide. So there are many hydrogen production technologies. I can't go into the details of this for paucity of time, but natural gas is very important and others are the so-called bio-based alcohols. So methanol, ethanol, you know, ethylene glycol, butanol, butanol glycerol, you know, all these things we did in our, uh, our lab. But electrolysis is the most important because everybody is talking about electrolysis. Big companies in India are announcing their plans, investments of four, few thousand crores. So, so that is in the news. What is not in the news is the other part of the story. So if you look at the electrolyzer, there are three important sources, alkaline, anion exchange, and proton exchange. But there are problems, technological problems. The problem is that, you know, the catalyst, the membranes, they were quite expensive and, and the, the current density and work uh, potential. So electrolyzers are not a cheap technology. They are very expensive. So or if you want to produce hydrogen from biomass, you can say that this is carbon neutral, but any carbon, whether it is sewage, forest, industrial waste, anywhere, you can have a, a gasifying agent. It can be air, it can be carbon dioxide, you know, oxygen, whatever. So that is one part of the story. Or you take the lignocellulose biomass, you can have biological processes, dark fermentation, for instance, or electrochemical or thermochemical. So you have a gasifier, then you clean it and then condition it so you get hydrogen or you can get a synthetic natural gas. You can make biofuels. So bio based, you know, fuels where the gasifying agent I mentioned that air, steam, carbon dioxide, etc. Hydrogen can also be produced by dark fermentation. Okay, so, so look at this. You want waste, food waste can be a good source of, uh, you know, by steam uh, gasification. This, this is called torrefaction. That is, one is a solid and others a gas, and you can have this so-called water gas sip reaction. So food waste is another source from where you can make hydrogen. But, you know, sometimes some things are they're good in the laboratory, but if you want to go to the plant scale, there are the problems. So like, for example, we did many of these things, like hydrogen productions from methanol, ethanol, ethylene, glycol, bitanol. We produce a lot of things. We have patents and we have published also. And so hydrogen and steam, more hydrogen comes from the water part of the, than the and the carbon that this, the oxygen is used for the carbon to make it carbon dioxide, right? However, what is most important is the thermochemical water splitting, which we worked a lot actually. So there are 310 reported cases. We also work on sulfur iodine cycle and the so-called copper chlorine cycle. Okay, this is what we did. So we know, so what is, why I'm talking about hydrogen economy? Because hydrogen is going to be very, very important in all places. So for example, our ministry, power ministry in 2022 said that 50% of our country's energy needs will be met by hydrogen or renewable energy rather by 2030. In other words, what it means, water and air are going to be our feedstock. So hydrogen coming from water, oxygen coming from water and nitrogen coming from air. So this will be our feedstock. So if you look at, so this is where the green ammonia synthesis also came into being. And Ammonia sector is well developed, transportation, storage, and whatnot. So a lot of countries are giving importance on this ammonia production, including government of India. 
So you take water, you split it by using renewable source, solar, wind, hydro, like what we did in a thermochemical process. Once you have this green hydrogen, and from, uh, by using pressure swing adsorption or cryogenics, you take nitrogen, you make uh, ammonia, and the ammonia sector, and of course you can crack ammonia and make hydrogen. And uh, so this is one, or even ammonia can, substitute, be, can be used as a substitute for hydrogen in turbines, boilers, fuel cells, engines, IC engines, particularly whatnot. So what is important is that by 2050, we'll have only two types of hydrogen, blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. Everything will not be green, but gray hydrogen would go. So this uh, information I collected from three different sources, and it is said that there will be an investment of $150 billion by then, okay? So, so in our case, because my work is supported by ONGC Energy Center, we have been saying since 2015, that we can produce hydrogen in less than a dollar, uh, provided the capacity is 100 tons per day. And so this is what we have been claiming. So we have many, many patents and publications in this area, but then our TRL level is six to seven, and we have now a pilot plant in Goa. So I'm going to tell you something. So what is the target? The target, worldwide target is called one, one, one. That is one kg hydrogen in one dollar in one decade. So US government, Joe Biden's government has said that this is the target and one, one, one in cricketing terms is a Nelson side. That means you can get out if you are on one, one, one. So one, one, one is a very difficult target. And what the US government is doing, they are saying that we will give $3, you know, uh, subsidy on that. And currently the gray hydrogen is about $2.5. So in our work, what we did, we are using solar power and we are storing energy in the molten salts and we use water and it's a closed loop cycle where copper chlorine, there are six different stages in that. We produce hydrogen and oxygen. So this hydrogen we have tried by making, converting carbon dioxide to methane and higher hydrocarbons, including LPG. We are using it for biomass conversion and also oxidation. So you see how many things we can make. We can make hydrocarbons, methanol, dimethyl ether, formic acid, ethylol, ethylene, syngas, green ammonia. So this particular slide gives the gist of my work and I've been saying that I can produce hydrogen in less than a dollar. Okay, so, so but this is, there is a reference. As regards the electrolyzers, the cost of electrolyzers in 2020 was anywhere between 1100 to 1500. And unless that cost comes down to 220, particularly today, people are saying it has to be less than 150 or less than 100, then only the electrolyzers will be, uh, you know, economical. So that is one part of the story. So you see the cost of gray hydrogen in all countries, it has not changed at all. That means the technology, there is nothing has changed in this, okay? It is steady, but for last, uh, you know, eight years, the cost is steady about 2.25 to 2.5 dollars per kg and you look at green hydrogen it is changing and it is going anywhere between 4.5 to 9 dollars so we did our calculation for our own process so if we probably go for one ton per day it is about 11 dollars so you can imagine production is one part of story transportation is another part of the story using it somewhere is another part so green hydrogen is not cheap. So you see that, and the electricity, a lot of electricity is required here. So per kilowatt hour, that is the unit. So anywhere between 18 cents US dollar to seven cents, okay? Even though in India, the cost of electricity is lower in comparison with the advanced world, still it is not free, okay? So, so what I did, you know, I compared my process with others' process. I like, say, suppose I have coal, you know, natural gas, our electricity and thermochemical process. The last uh, column here is my process. So you can see that, you know, when you use coal, 19 tons of uh, carbon dioxide is emitted per ton of hydrogen. Gray natural gas is 11 tons, which is the refinery that is made. If you use turquoise, it is zero. Blue, that is 0.2. And so, and the cost can vary where anywhere between, you know, this is typically for 100 tons per day, remember. So it is a, based on the economy of scale. So we say that we can produce, uh, so 
Now, very interestingly, our work was, you know, Honorable Nitin Gadkari ji had seen my, uh, my plant, and so he mentioned our work by name in uh, in Rajya Sabha on uh, on sixth of December last year. Not so much so uh, during the you know this uh, energy India Energy Week in uh, February this year, our plant was inaugurated by the Minister, you know, uh, Rameshwar Teli. In fact. Uh, so you can see that this is my research group. They are working there. We have set up this plant and uh, we are doing a lot of work. work. There. Right now, this plant is in Goa. Okay, so these are my students and support staff. This is uh, Energy, this ONGC chairman who visited to see what we are doing because they are supporting us. And so the next story is that what will happen? Suppose there is no carbon, there is no fossil fuel, no, no you know, uh, crude oil. So the incentives, look, US is giving incentive of $3 per kg. India announced on this. They say green hydrogen, rupees 50 first year, then 40, next and 30. And if you make green ammonia, it will correspondingly based on stoichiometry, it is 8.82 per kg, then 7 and 5.3. But this is not enough. So in this hydrogen business, the policy matters a lot across the world because everybody wants to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. So, so what will happen? Supposing there is no crude oil uh, by 2050. Can carbon dioxide be used, the new oil? So this is what I've been saying, that carbon dioxide can be converted by using hydrogen. So the importance of hydrogen is announced here. We can make urea, methanol, hydrocarbons, dimethyl, liter, name it. And the catalysis will be, th these processes will be thermochemical, chemical catalysis, biological, plasma, electrochemical, photochemical. You can do all sorts of reactions with carbon dioxide and, and this can be coupled and you can make it lean and whatnot. So, of course, there are others, you know, which is small scale, chemistry is fascinating, but these are not the major usages of carbon dioxide. Another important part, once I make carbon dioxide go convert it to methanol, there is our Niti I is talking a lot about methanol economy. When methanol can be a feedstock, and methanol is used in a, you know race car engine. So this will be very important, and so will be dimethyl ether. Dimethyl ether can be used wherever methanol is. So that is going to be the future. So what we did, we did integrated work in our laboratory. So we converted carbon dioxide into methane and hydrocarbons, and we can use any carbon dioxide, including coal-fired power plants. This work is supported by ONGC Energy Center, and, and this can be commercialized. So we have 26 companies showing interest in our technology. So perhaps this will happen sooner than anything else. Okay, so this in this three companies showed interest in this methane, total 26 companies. Then dimethyl ether. Dimethyl ether is a very good substitute for diesel. It is a substitute for LPG and you can blend it. So very easily the same infrastructure can be used. Remember when we are talking about new fuel, it is the infrastructure. Hydrogen infrastructure has to be developed. I'm a member of this committee of government of India's committee on how to develop hydrogen infrastructure. So dimethyl ether. So in dimethyl ether, Godavari biorefineries, you know, there's, they are making these fermentation processes and they produce 300 tons per day. Now they have enhanced their capacity. This number is 500 tons. So I told them, why don't you join hands with me? So they have done it. And we are now going to sell this technology where we make carbon dioxide, you know, converting into dimethyl ether. Okay, the same is carbon dioxide to methanol. Methanol is coming again into the prominence because methanol cost is about 27, 28 rupees per kg. But carbon dioxide, a liability we are making into ethanol. So many companies have shown interest in that, including you know international companies. So we can make green methanol, green urea, green fertilizer industry. But the other part of the story, which people do not know, the biorefinery, that means using biomass to make chemicals, it's not a new concept. This was already there in the 18th and 19th century. At that time, it was called oilery. That is the blubber of the whale was used to make, you know, you know soap and also used as a fuel. So you can see this was called oilery. 
Now what happened because of excessive, you know, hunting of this uh, catching of this whale, the population started dwindling, it came to almost an extinction. But every time there is technological advance. So what happened? This coal and crude oil, they saved the whale population. So in, particularly in 1859, the, birth, uh, the oil industry was, you know, started by Edwin, Colonel Edwin Drake. He drilled the first well at a depth of something like 69 feet. And later on, because it was viscous, they heated it. And so this is how the thermal cracking came into being. But believe me, they had no use for gasoline or petrol. So it was being dumped into sea and lakes and whatnot. Only in 18, oh, 1907, Henry Ford had this first automobile. That is the time when petrol found some use. Now refineries have grown like anything, okay? Uh, so you can see that now refineries, see, so now they are complex business. The World War II was won by the Allied forces because they had better quality fuel, aviation fluid. So you see, uh, so a lot of things happened during that time. And refineries, the maximum catalytic processes are used in refineries. So we are happy today because of refineries. But at the same time, we created this problem of carbon dioxide. So refineries are complex and their waste is very minimal. So, so what are the, suppose we don't have you know, crude oil, what are we going to do it? Because today the capacity of refined is 100 million barrels per day. This may become 100, by 2050, uh, 150, or we will have something cheaper, okay, like biorefinery. So the petroleum refinery, I can uh, compare with bio refinery. Left hand side, you go on adding, uh, you know, and make so benzene, toluene, xylene, butene. That is one the left hand. So that is functionalization. On the right hand side, it is defunctionalization. We have all sorts of chemicals, you know, stereochemicals, sugars, phenols, furans. We do defunctionalization. So bio refineries are more expensive. The products are more expensive than the crude refiners. So we can take any signalized biomass. That is what I told you in the beginning, why the farmers are burning it. And we can convert into a variety of bio-based products by fermentation or by any catalytic process. So biohydrogen, syngas, bioalcohols, whatever you name it, that is going to be the future. So we can have an integrated biorefinery. There's so because you know this this biomass is cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. So typically lignin is burnt, or you know so-called cogen processes in sugar factories. So we can take cellulose. You see how many chemicals I can make by just having this integrated biorefinery. And in all these processes, very interestingly, hydrogen and oxygen play a very important role. So we can do all sorts of things. So biomass valorization, hydrogen rules. So see how many reactions I can do by using hydrogen. And so this is cellulose and hemicellulose, hydrogenation, hydrogenolysis, dehydrogenation, oxidation, hydration, isomerization. And same is the case with biomass. Since it contains oxygen, you have to remove this oxygen if you want to make a you know, hydrocarbon, right? So we and it's very interestingly the hemicellulose part we don't require a sugar cane for this i can make sugars from c5 c6 uh, you know sugars like xylose and arabinose so that is another part of the story and lignin can be valorized to variety of products i can make benzene toluene xylene also only thing is the conversion cost so when we don't have any crude oil in future lignin is going to save us and hydrogen so we did a, you know, some work. So you see in this particular slide, I have C5, C6 sugars. They can be oxidation, hydrogenation, hydrogenolysis. So top portion, cellulose and hemicellulose and the bottom portion is lignin. You see how hydrogen rules. So when I said hydrogen is a savior, that is what I mean that, you know, I can take any biomass, any carbon source and convert that into a variety of chemicals. So again, hydrogen and hydrogen and oxygen. So we did a lot of work on this, uh, you know, biomass based chemicals. All of these are oxygen containing compounds. I won't go into this, uh, you know, processes, but this is just to give a glimpse of that. So we can have production of bioalcohols, you know, bioalkaline side or bioalkanes by using carbon dioxide and biomass. Okay. 
so particularly farmers can be you know their income can be multiplied by using hydrogenation or hydrogenolysis so any bio instead of burning that so so this could be the waste to waste factories so farmers cooperative agri waste factories should be established rather than just giving them free money that is my personal belief because what you need is densification of biomass and transport of that to some other place where you have the factory and that by that you know they will benefit so yes no burning of you know carbon no pollution so you know jokingly i say going to delhi during the winter will be a pleasant surprise okay so to see how many things we burn all these sugar cane cotton pulses cereal rice so many you know this is the agri waste which we produce right about 500 million metric tons so so if you have a lignocellulosic biomass i have three processes one is gasification liquefaction and liquid phase reforming and you see how many xylose glucose lignin i can produce a variety of chemicals okay so that is one part of the story so the basic question you know i, I always ask is should be using bioethanol although our government says and majority of the governments including brazil they say you know that is the way to do it but my personal belief is that yes to reduce our import we have to go for it but it should not be a permanent policy by 2030 30, 35 we should revisit it and should not use ethanol or any other biomass you know for fuel so we did this analysis also so for example left hand side you know this is refinery where they use steam reforming of methane to make uh, hydrogen and that hydrogen is used in eight different processes and on the right hand side we have biomass so hydrogen whether you have refinery based uh, crude re based refinery or biomass based refinery hydrogen is a must okay so what we did we did some analysis we said people are talking a lot so let us do some analysis if i take 1 kg of crude oil it gives me 32 megajoules of fuels plus 0.2 kg chemical this is a standard refine somebody may change the ratio however if i take 1 kg of biomass it will give me only 6 megajoules of energy or 0.8 kg chemicals okay so so what what it means so we you know did this calculations for 97.4 million Uh, barrels per day refinery so that is something like 215 barrels per second of fuels if i convert 100% biomass into fuels it is only 10 barrels per second you see jaw drop by orders of magnitude or if i convert biomass into chemicals it gives me 320 so common sense tells me that it is better to make chemicals rather than burning a biomass as a fuel and also you will have you know better control of carbon dioxide so my, i i reiterate my statement before that you know carbon negative technologies right so for example if i make bioethanol i can valorize bioethanol i can dehydrate it make ethylene and ethylene becomes a you know feed stock for 11 different chemicals these are high value chemicals so it is better to convert ethanol into chemicals ethylene and chemicals than burning it so carbon should not be burned you know that is the you know conclusion from this yes you burn it for some time as ethanol bioethanol but as i told you that that policy has to be revisited in next 10 years time so another problem we face as a society is the consumer plastics and plastics you know everybody hates plastic although they are benefited they hate it the reason is that so what has happened the governments the, for example the single use plastic sup government of india also banned banned it in 2022 october 2nd my personal belief is one technology creates a problem another technology must solve it ban is not a solution wherever there is a liquor ban maximum liquor is sold in that place yeah, you know that right so so what should we do ban should not be there so i have a solution like for example somebody comes to your home in the morning drops the newspaper the housewife collects it and sells it sometimes the content is the raddi is very valuable in content, uh, in comparison with the content in that paper can we not do it for plastic so so can we sort it out so yes so my suggestion is that this sup pollution is due to free and cheap availability of plastic and that is why we are throwing it 
like for example you go to any marriage party there are so many dishes like hundreds of dishes maybe at least 100 and since it is free you take it because they are decorated nice looking and you don't eat it so you waste more food because it is free instead suppose there was some bowl there kept in front of each and every dish and a notice was given there like okay sir or madam put 100 rupees and then touch this dish nobody your wife will not allow you to touch that i know that because you you use it because you think it is free and at the end of the marriage ceremony give that money to the boy and girl okay jokes apart what it means because it is free we are creating this pollution so what should we do so you have you must have a refundable deposit on anything whether it is a plastic pet bottle the water bisleri whatever you call or the straw or the pouch which is used for storing milk supposing everything irrespective of size is 10 rupee per article refundable deposit you use a, you know a barcode you take your money back and if you are not uh, lazy that somebody else will come to your home and collect it sorting of plastic at resource at source itself will save a lot of money because 80 percent of the money is on this the segregation so we can use plastic chemical recycling because chemicals can be made from plastic so depolymerization everybody knows you can go back to monomers and what but the best thing is the so-called chemolysis pyrolysis and gasification we can do this we have been working in this area for some time so we can make many chemicals for example hydrolysis glycolysis so we have done you know pet we have done nylon you know we are doing polyurethane you can break the backbone by chemical processes. But worst part is hydrogen. Hydrogenation of waste plastic, irrespective of, you know, you may have any mixture of plastic, you know, hydrogenolysis creates all these chemicals. And what does it do? It, do, it will give me a mixture of hydrocarbons and HCl, water, ammonia, H2S. And these technologies are known. We don't have to reinvent the thing. So ultimately what it means, it takes many place plastic, you do this chemical processing and you can get the hydrocarbon back. So that should be the policy rather than banning it. And so, and we, we, we and this is a very important source of, you know, our energy and materials. So what we did, we did we, we, a pet waste cycle. We studied some of these things. We developed beautiful theories. We have a patent also. So we can convert, for example, polyethylene terthalate into terthalic acid and ethylene glycol. Similarly, we can do for nylon also. So yes, we can do it. Also, you can do the so-called bio-upcycling of polyethylene terthalate. I won't go into the details of this, but what it means, this is called recycle engineering. Unless we recycle whether the waste is solid, liquid, or gas, we have no future. Otherwise, we'll require five Earths. So very important that we and hydrogen is going to play a very important role. Another thing is solar panels, wind turbines, plastic, batteries, construction and debris waste. We have to recycle it. So that means technology must be developed for producing materials. Some of them can be used, they can be reused, they can be converted. So for example, solar panels, how many you know rare earths are there? You have metal, you have aluminum. You know, all sorts of things are there. Same is the case with wind blades. Wind blade, something like 240 meter uh, in length. So you see, and we started in 2000, year 2000. Now many of these things have outlived their life about 20 plus years. So they are available. Millions of tons is lying around. Same is the case with battery recycling. When the battery life goes to 80%, it is useless, but it can be used for something else. That is storage batteries, right? So yes, batteries, leaching of bio, battery from bio, bio leaching or other thing. So this is called circular energy storage and China is number one actually in this. They will have a business of about $45 billion by 2030. In fact, 70% of EV batteries, you know, can be recycled. So, and we are talking a lot about EV, okay? So you see this next is the, and so EV is what? If you are producing a, a, you know, electricity by coal, it is CV, it is not EV, right? Only thing the source is going somewhere else. Same is the case with global steel production. India, China is number one, India is number two. We have something like 127 million metric tons produced last year. And this number will be 300 
in 2030, 520, 50. And all this is highly polluting because one ton of steel produces something like 2.38 tons of you know, carbon dioxide. So instead we can use green hydrogen. Okay, so this will be green steel. So very important that green steel, green nickel, okay, green fertilizer. So, you know, in a McKinsey report recently, they said that there will be need of 539 metric tons of million metric tons rather of hydrogen in 2050, and there will be widespread applications. So actually what it means, hydrogen will be used in variety of stages, coaches, buses, ferries, you know, ships and whatnot. So that is going to happen. So this is where society is must accept hydrogen as a energy carrier apart from what we are doing right now and interestingly hydrogen is much safer than fossil fuels all simulations and actual like you know experiments have shown that hydrogen is safer okay nothing can be 100 percent safer but this is shown to be safer than petrol and diesel vehicles okay so yes so uh you know and very recently this hydrogen energy car you know, this takes five seconds. And yesterday I saw in the JCB, you know, this company, what, what a nice uh, hydrogen uh, uh, vehicle they are using. And that is where, uh, so this is the future, right? So each work has to pass through three stages as Swami Vivekanand said, radical opposition then acceptance. So hydrogen will be accepted by society. So once again, I close that is, the so-called green economy, bioeconomy, bio-based economy, a circular economy, that is going to happen. So green hydrogen will be the savior. Carbon dioxide will be the new oil. Waste biomass can be valorized. And the entire world is doing that. The hydrogen economy can be nicely intertwined with many other processes to make chemicals and materials. And my technology is one of them. So I thank my students who have been working in my laboratory for a number of years. So we have this uh, work going on for quite some time. So if you have any questions, you can ask me because I restricted to a time limit you had set. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Yadav, for such a wonderful and informative talk. So you said that you'll be talking about net zero, but you talked about carbon negative. Which is yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is actually a good because net zero is a, is a reference term, you know. <laughs> right. So it, it is not only good for us, but our future generation as well. Yeah. So after listening to such a wonderful talk, I'm sure there'll be many questions. So if you allow, we can have a couple of yeah, questions. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No problem. So I would request everyone to please raise your hand and uh, I will call and then you can ask the question. Yeah. Yes, Professor Bhadwaj. Thank you, Professor Yadav, for a very informative talk. Thank you. <laughs> And it was so elaborate and very clear for many of us to understand, uh, you know, overall what is happening in this area yeah, yeah. where we are talking about green hydrogen. But uh, my question is, in addition to green hydrogen, is there any other source which people may be working on or is there a research going on in the country or outside the you country? know no, see actually a very good question people have been working on many things and why hydrogen as i told you the reason why hydrogen came into prominence because of its utility in all sectors many many sectors of course you can have blue hydrogen green hydrogen was story blue hydrogen where you capture the carbon dioxide you sequester maybe use it for making more oil in our soil recovery and things like that that is but of course you know people have been saying nuclear energy actually nuclear energy is the simplest form of energy but not many people will give credit to nuclear energy and that contribution is less than two percent right you know this so people have been working what are all of you know the, the fission and what not people are talking about these are all futuristic Anything which has to be converted into technology must be cheap. And we always will compare it with the current cost of any fuel or whatever. And why hydrogen, they say $1, because they say currently, okay, hydrogen is $2.5 and it gives me fuels, petrol, diesel, and whatnot. Can I make it less than $1? So, and in future, believe me, crude oil will cost up because become about $200 a barrel. So no, nobody is going to use it. So it is economy which is going to control. 
but of course there are many coal can be used for example the government of india has a policy on coal so they say coal go to syn gas and then again hydrogen can be taken from there co can be converted into variety of other things like the carbon dioxide which i mentioned to you so there yes then hydro it's what the three important thing government of india says about 500 gigawatt you know power they will buy 2030 some people say that it should be 900 we should be exporting country power uh, uh, renewable power than than uh, importing so but believe me it is it is not just a technology but the policy policy matters a lot in this what incentive you give you know incentives given in the western countries particularly europe is deciding all these things you know not even usa it is europe which is deciding Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my one more question: Can I be allowed? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, you know, the conditions in different countries are different. Yeah. You know, European countries, uh, uh, Western world, which is say, Arab world, and uh, Eastern world, Southeastern world. So, are there any work going on with respect to Indian subcontinent or Indian continent, where because we are all in the tropical regions? yeah and uh, suitability of this kind of uh, uh, form of fuel particularly when we are very much enriched with the solar yeah, you know, illumination yeah. or sunlight yeah. available to all of us yeah so will in long run hydrogen will be the thing or it will be solar no 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 it, energy will be always a mix solar wind and yes. hydrogen because you know the solar and wind they, they will give me a lot of energy but now they they are talking about combination of solar and wind because solar has only 6 to 7 hours right what do you do for uh, the remaining so solar wind hydrogen they will have hydro powers also but they may not build many uh, hydro electricity dams and thing like that so obviously it will be a combination of those it is not going to be just one single source it will not be one single source okay good thank you okay so next hand i see by professor lokesh sahu professor sahu yes thank you sir um, uh, my question is about uh, yeah you yes, you know that um, is much better in terms of uh, liquid or solid based fuel the hydrogen is much better Uh, particularly to reduce the carbon loading from the atmosphere yeah. the question is that uh, because this technology using hydrogen as a fuel in house high temperature combustion mm. and which uses ambient air kind of thing which is mm. mixture of nitrogen and oxygen mm. and you know that the high temperature combustion produces lot of reactive nitrogen like no and no2 mm. and that have serious environmental impact Mm. so how how will we address this issue you know uh, you know when they burn hydrogen and oxygen uh, the temperature is not that high what you call it's not that high uh, it requires a spark it just requires a spark so i, I personally i saw this uh, you know in that jcb factory uh, and you know you don't see anything coming out it is just, even the water vapor is not seen unless the temperature is very low maybe in cold countries you can see but at the same time in certain cases suppose i use ammonia as a fuel which is being promoted by everybody germany is the leader in that the nordic countries are the leader if you do that even our because it's a storage problem no ultimately hydrogen requires 300 to 700 atmospheres minus 250 to degree celsius ammonia doesn't require that ammonia 10 atmosphere and that infrastructure is available but if you use ammonia in place of hydrogen and if you burn it it will generate nox so that means it has to be coupled with another technology where that nox is converted into nitrogen okay so that that additional catalytic converter has to be there you know three way catalyst like what they three way converter so that is required there if you burn ammonia per se or if you split it and convert it into hydrogen and nitrogen then the hydrogen can be used but in c2 so what is happening right now including india is that they are saying the major sector because we want to reduce our carbon footprint by 45% argument say okay by you know 2030 so the areas where we can use this and reduce the carbon footprint that will be very very useful to us that is what we are saying 
So at the same time, there are technological challenges, transport, storage, and all. So right now also, what is happening in the so-called SNG, you take uh, methane, okay, and you add hydrogen in that, or you take uh, compressed natural gas, add hydrogen. So Indian oil tried this up to 18% of hydrogen in that. So it will reduce the carbon emissions and it will be good for the environment. In fact, there are companies in Germany which are claiming that they have used, you know, uh, you know, this more than 18%. They have gone to 30%, 40%. But these are at research stage. And, uh, and actually, they don't have to make a lot of new modifications, you know, in the... Uh, in, and in the, you know what requires is only 10 atmosphere and uh, hydrogen when we it is taken to the fuel to burn it is only 10 atmosphere but the storage tank is at much higher temp uh, pressure okay that is that is the beauty not many people know that but they, they think that that pressure is very high. no it is only 10 atmosphere you can uh, put any cylinder and start burning and run your car but but storage is important so for that you require a different kind of material now so they have this fiber carbon fiber type of material is being developed there's a company in baroda also and some other places you know uh, i think uh, inox or something they they are developing these uh, cylinders where hydrogen will be stored and taken now government of india uh, they, they allowed jcb to go up to 350 atmosphere but real target is 700 atmosphere, and that is there. I perhaps you know there is an organization called PESU, PESO, which is based in Nagpur. They give this certification, so they are only done up to 350 now. They are not gone up to 700. So that is what I said. You know, policy is very important in in driving any technology. Okay, thank okay, you, sir. Thank you. So our next question is by Professor Dashivasto. Actually, it is from me, Harris Gadwe here. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, one of the highlights for me was that instead of converting bio waste into the biofuel, it is more meaningful to convert into bio uh, chemicals, other types of chemicals. Yes. Uh, yes. Bio waste as well as for the plastics. So the processes that you listed, is there anything that we have to worry about that that process will also generate some new kind of waste that we we, we don't currently have. No, I, I, no, no, listen. What is, see, for example, if I take plastic, I told you, give you examples. If I, suppose I take uh, PVC and I have uh, hydrogenolysis, I do. I will get oil which will be cracked. Okay, I will have a variety of fractions there and HCL will come out. That HCL absorption technology is no. Or if I do nylon, ammonia will come out. Ammonia absorption is well known. Okay. So those things are, but the but very important part is that I get hydrocarbons. Okay, and these hydrocarbons become a source of energy and materials and what. So the waste plastic, you know, of course, in many cases you get char when you do pyrolysis, okay, about biomass, that you get biochar. Okay, that biochar is very useful. It is, you know, it is used in uh, farms so, and what? Uh, soil enrichment and also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soil enrichment. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, sir, if you allow, I also want to ask one question. No problem. Yeah. So, in the beginning, you showed a bar chart. Which it was a yes. scan bar chart where you were showing the contribution from different type of uh, energy energy generation. And there you showed that wind and solar is keep increasing, but others are remaining constant. So right. nuclear, you made the nuclear part that fraction was constant throughout up to 2050. So no, that is that is nuclear, no? See, see, nuclear only France is leading in that. Others like Germany and they closed it. And India, in India's contribution is not about 2.5%. It is about 2.5%. But, but it must... is not expected to increase in future. The re no, the reason I tell you because other, you see, ultimately it is cost. Okay, that is the cost. So the other, the cost of other things. But I tell you, nuclear energy is very good for environmental viewpoint, the net zero or whatever you say. But <laughs> but the contribution is not increasing because they are capital intensive industry. Yeah, even including that uh, nuclear fusion, people are trying this to go. Yeah, yeah, that. Them. So so the yeah, fusion and fusion. Those kind of things, they are things of future. Right now, we cannot predict, I must tell you that. Okay, okay. 
Okay, let me read a question from YouTube. It is asked by Dr. C. B. S. Dutt. Yeah. So he's asking, can you suggest off late research is going on in blue economy in coastal region and the plastic recovery and LCA in circular economy in a vital is a vital component? No, so it seems as I talked about circular economy. Everything has to be recycled in the same form or a different form through reaction. So in plastic, there is upcycling, downcycling, and recycling. Okay, where you value add, it is upcycling. When you crack it and go down cycling, but it does not affect the environment. That is the meaning of that. Or like you know, you take plastic and you say, okay, build roads also, put it in tar. Okay, that is one part of the story because you want to take care of the pollution. But plastic is a very important source of hydrocarbons. Okay, that is what I told you. And of course, we can make many other things like the methanolysis, ammonolysis, aminolysis solvolysis, hydrolysis, you can break that because the backbone of the plastic has to be broken. Okay, that is what I told you. And you can break it by using ammonia, for example. Yeah. Okay, you can do many things. So, so valorization of waste is the very important thing for our economy. Because you know that the uh, technically we should have zero waste society, but, <laughs> but ideally rather, it will not happen because we will, but year by year, Supposing, for example, Mumbai produces 900 tons, 9,000 tons of uh, waste every day, of which 50% is food waste. If I go on reducing it day by day, that means I am contributing to the greenness of the planet. That is what our objective should be. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for giving such a nice talk and answering all the questions. Now I request uh, Dr. Bhushit Vishnu for the word of thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Rastogi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Professor Yadav, for sparing your valuable time from your very busy uh, schedule. We could see a lot of students were surrounded. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to the airport now. I'm going to the airport. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. So, okay. so many, many thanks for uh, sparing the time and a wonderful talk. Uh, I thank our director, Professor Bhardwaj, and our dean, Professor Palam Raju, for always encouraging uh, this activity. Uh, thanks to our uh, Vyakhyan committee. Thanks to Professor Bala for bringing you uh, for today's uh, talk. Thanks to all our WebEx and YouTube uh, viewers. Uh, thank you very much for joining and asking questions and interactions. Uh, please stay tuned for next lecture, next Vyakhyan on 24th April. Until then, Take care of uh, you and your family. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Yadav. Thank you. Okay. Thank you once again.